So, folks, today I just want to talk about an interview that Donald Trump had with Hannity, Sean Hannity. And in that interview, he went on to describe how Nixon was paid 16 or $18 million for his top secret information, right? The information that he kept. So he's kind of drawing this analogy like, well, Nixon did it, you know, and it's okay for me to do it. But are the cases really the same? Let's take a look at that. But before we do, folks, I got to show you this. So the topography of the day, folks, is Ronna McDaniel, who is the ex-RNC chairwoman, has been hired as an NBC contributor. And everybody's blown a fuse over this. And rightfully so. I mean, she's an election denier. Uh, she was cheering on Trump, evidently, when it was time for that call to be made to Georgia, to Brad Raffensperger, to find 11,780 votes. Uh, she was there for that. And what we're seeing is these people, you know, I've called it a cult. Everybody's called it a cult. We've seen these people move into the cult, out of the cult. And the thing that's interesting about what she said in this interview, and Chuck Todd, who's also the anchor for Meet the Press, literally blew a fuse. He was the first one to blow a fuse. And again, rightfully so. But what she said in an interview, uh, not with Chuck Todd, but with one of the other anchors, um, what she said was, well, at the time, I think they were talking about election denial, you know, and, and how the rigged election and all this kind of stuff. She said, at the time, I took one for the team, and th this this was my stance. Like, when you're behind the veil, you know, the Trump cult, you just do what the team needs to do. And when you're out of that, you know, then you can speak frankly. So it raises that whole question in my mind as to where are the loyalties? I, I think that obviously, and I think everybody listening would probably agree that the loyalties should be to country, country over party all the time, um, without exception. You know, it just goes to show you that, uh, you know, that's not the case with these people. And I think it's something that you got to understand is the, is we say that it's a cult, you know, we say all this kind of stuff and we say it in a, a derogatory fashion, but it's a truth. I mean, whether you call it a cult or whether you call it the team, when these people are operating under the team, this is what happens. And um, I mean, there's nothing more contrary, obviously, to to being patriotic than just doing something for the team as opposed to the country. So, folks, the uh, the hush money case is also in uh, in full focus today. Trump spent the night at Trump Tower. The people with the placards are positioning themselves at Trump Tower. You know, the guys with the political damnation placards, uh, you know, doing the, the good work, pointing things out while they're on TV with those placards behind them. They're also there at Trump Tower. Uh, so you've got the hush money case that's going on. You've got Trump trying to come up with the money, the $464 million to post a bond in that Judge Engeron civil fraud trial. Um, and you've got uh, Donald Trump over the weekend saying, he scraped together the money that he was going to be using for the campaign. And then I don't know if that's what the lawyers wanted him to say because they're petitioning obviously for mercy and some sort of a stay based on the fact that he can't get that money together. Um, but have a listen to this. So I got sh <laughs> to show you this for God's sakes. So this is Eric Trump and he was on Maria Bartiromo's show. <laughs> God, And, um, you know, the, the poor guy's just losing it. You know, he's just, um, you know, he's just like a, a, an engine that's spitting, you know, spark plugs and cogs, you know, are coming out left and right. Um, but this is what he said on her show. Um, have a listen to this. It, it, no one's ever seen a bond th this size. Every single person when I came to them saying, hey, can I get a half billion dollar bond? Maria, they were laughing. They were laughing. Yeah. Top exec. Hmm. Um, okay. Well, folks, there's only two possibilities here for Eric. They were either laughing with you or against you. And I'll let the public decide which one it is, but, um, I don't know. I mean, either they're either just laughing with you or against you. I mean, to me, 
it's sort of ludicrous that with so many rich cronies over the weekend, these people, including Eric and Don Jr., who's just falling apart at the seams, and his father, it seems like they spent the whole time, uh, you know, ridiculing Judge Engeron for this judgment as opposed to like squeezing their rich cronies, you know, for the money. So, folks, I want to play you the interview with Sean Hannity, and here's Donald Trump. Have a listen to this. So, listen to how he describes the the documents that he has, and we'll see if he's conflating that with Richard Nixon and that that whole situation. I believe the question. I can't. I can't imagine you ever saying, um, "Bring me some of the boxes that we brought back from the White House. I'd like to look at them." Did you ever do that? I would have the right to do that. There's nothing wrong with but it. But I know you. I don't think you really? would do it. Well, I, I don't have a lot of time, but I would have the right to do that. Right. I would do that. There'd be All right, let me wrong. move on. Let me remember in. this. Yeah. This is the Presidential Records Act. I have the right to take stuff. Do you know that they ended up paying Richard Nixon, I think, eighteen million dollars for what he had? They did. Ooh, really? Interesting. So I'm going to dig into that a little bit, folks, but did you hear what he said? That's exactly what is going to be hashed out with Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, is whether or not he had the right to take the top secret documents. Did he or did he not have the right? And obviously, repeated attempts to try to get those documents back, repeated attempts by the government to say, no, you've got to give them back. And Trump did not cooperate. In fact, he actually made attempts to move these documents to other locations, according to some of the testimony folks. But interestingly enough, he's, he's, he's describing a situation, he's comparing it to Richard Nixon. And are the two the same? That's what we want to figure out. Presidential Records Act. I have the right to take stuff. I have the right to look at stuff. But they have the right to talk, and we have the right to talk. This would have all been worked out. All of a sudden, they raided Mar-a-Lago, viciously raided Mar-a-Lago. Vicious? I had tape, and I gave them tapes. You know, I gave them tapes of storage areas. I gave it to them. I could have held that back. I wasn't holding anything back that I cared about. I gave them tape. But you know the tape they don't want me to reveal? If possible. They've asked me, and I've, I've so far adhered to it. The raid itself. Wait a we minute. Have I'll take that tape I and I'll air that tape. Everybody would take that tape. Well, that's an interesting, so let's, interesting point that he made about the tape of the vicious. I mean, how, how do you do a vicious raid? What, what, what does that mean? Um, I mean, I, I, I'd love to know, did they beat down the door? No, they didn't beat down the door. How do you make a raid vicious? I mean, how can a raid occur without being vicious? And, and what does he think made it vicious? I mean, Melania has talked about how they went through her underwear drawer. You know, they went rifled through her underwear drawer. And she thought that was vicious, but they're looking for things. I don't think they threw things out. I think they just went through it. Does that constitute vicious? I mean, maybe it is in her case, because when you're Melania Trump, she lives in Palm Beach, right? Most of the time, where do you go to replace underwear? And she replaced it all. Do you just go down to Palm Beach and say, oh, they went through viciously, went through my underwear drawers, and I need more underwear. And it's expensive, right? I mean, if you're talking Emilio Pucci or something like that, I mean, it can, yes. I guess that's what maybe could make it vicious. And she, God forbid, would not cross the bridge right, with her entourage and go to something like Target because I don't think she's wearing stuff from Target. Now, for Donald Trump, um, it's a whole different kettle of fish here, folks, you know, and we've talked about what what might be going on underneath the um, the undergarments there and, and what he's getting, and, and I think you can get those on Amazon, right? Whole different, um, whole different ball game there, which we don't need to go into, but what makes it vicious? What may, you know, what, what, what makes it vicious? I'd love to know. And the fact that he said they asked him not to release the tapes, that doesn't sound like a command. So the only reason why he's holding on to the tapes is that he's going to hold them out for the highest bidder. So you just wait for that. You just wait for that. Those tapes aren't going to be released without a price tag, folks. But I want to show you this. So let's take a look at the article 
And this is coming to us from the Los Angeles Times, the LA Times. This is going way back to June 13th of 2000. God, that's a, that's a long way back. Back in 2000, I was living in Chicago and I was an IT manager for Cargill Investor Services. And, you know, the, uh, the Y2K thing was going on and over with um, and all that kind of fun stuff. But that's, that's a long time ago. But this article is from that. And it says, U.S. to pay $18 million for Nixon tapes and papers. The federal government has agreed to pay $18 million to the estate of Richard Nixon to settle claims that the Watergate tapes and other presidential materials were improperly seized by the government in 1974 without compensation. The out-of-court agreement, climaxing a five-month civil trial that ended last year, would result in $6 million in improvements and expansion for the Richard Nixon Library and Birthplace in Yorba Linda, California, and paves the way for copies of his White House tapes, tape recordings, and papers to eventually be made available at the Orange County facility. So there, right there, folks, we're talking about tape recordings and papers. The first paragraph, presidential materials. So it would seem to me that Donald Trump is conflating top secret information that's so top secret that it's marked to only be read in a skiff, which is a secure compartmental uh, intelligence facility or something like that. Something so secure that you have to be in this literally cone of silence. Remember that? The cone of silence. You've got to be in the cone of silence to even read these things. I mean, there, there's a conflation going on between what Donald Trump has and all that top secret information and presidential materials like tape recordings and papers. So the article continues to say that Justice Department lawyers argued in federal court last year that placing any value on Nixon's materials was speculative and that in no case should payment exceed $2.2 million. Lawyers for Nixon's heirs sought compensation of $213 million for 3,700 hours of tapes and more than 4 million pages of historic White House documents. David W. Ogden, the Justice Department official in charge of the case, called it a fair resolution that brings to a close 20 years of litigation surrounding Nixon's materials. Shortly after Nixon's resignation in 1974, Congress decreed that the General Services Administration, the parent agency of the National Archives, should seize all his White House recordings and papers to guarantee that Nixon would not destroy them. Until that time, presidents traditionally were free to take all their papers, and again, their papers, and other historic materials with them into retirement. Contrast that with what Donald Trump did. The article says, but Congress made an exception in Nixon's case because he was the first president to resign in a criminal scandal. His successor, Gerald R. Ford, granted him a full pardon from any possible future prosecution. Nixon's lawyer spent subsequent years trying to legally block public access to the Watergate tapes, arguing that many of the conversations were private and privileged. Does that sound familiar? Private and privileged? And that's what he's arguing in a lot of these cases. And he's also arguing, as you heard him say, that he has the right, which is going to be directly hashed out in that courtroom with his appointee, that judge appointee, Eileen Cannon. And let's see if she's going to be fair about this and how she's going to interpret the law. I, I have a feeling that that's going to go off the rails, folks, if it hasn't already. Though so the question remains, do you think there's a conflation between what Trump was talking about and what Nixon was talking about here. I, I think there is, folks. I think there is, it's like apples and oranges between the two cases. But we'll see. Till next time, folks, I want to thank you for joining me.